So gender um, is one of the primary ways in which we organize the social world. Um, and in this sense, uh, uh, gender is one of the most important uh, sociological concepts that we analyze, in part because so much of our day-to-day -day life um, centers around the gendered organization of that life. If you think just for a moment about the family um, and the ways in which families are constructed, family construction in most instances are deeply gendered. Uh, there are different kinds of tasks that are allocated to different kinds of people, typically. Um, and that often happens on the basis of gender. Now, some of this is biological, um, which is to say that there are sometimes biological reasons for some of the distributions of tasks. Um, so, for example, the feeding of children, um, especially when in the earliest of infancies, for much of human society has been primarily performed by women, in part because they're the people who are physically able to do such a thing. But we need to recognize that it's not just biological and that biolo biology has some but limited sets of explanations for why it is that things are organized the ways in the ways in which they are. And so despite being firmly rooted in minds and bodies, gender and sexuality are profoundly social relations. In this lecture and in this series of lectures, I will not deny at all, the biology of um, uh, some forms of difference, and that there are biological differences between groups which have consequences um, for things that they're able to do. But I will suggest that the manifestations of difference are often a product of social rather than biological difference, and that the social and the biological work in dialogue with one another um, in order to create lived gender as it's experienced. Gender and, sexual and sexuality also intersect with other kinds of social relationships, creating a dense multitude of experiences, and in particular of unequal interactions and unequal institutions. And so thematically, through the set of lectures that I'll be giving on gender and sexuality, we'll think about how gender is socially organized which is to say how it is embedded in our social relationships and our social institutions, will ask how gender and sexuality are intersectional with other relationships. What we mean by that is how it is that they're connected to other kinds of social relationships that are deeply important. This means thinking about things like inequalities or thinking about things like race or nation and how those are tied to or overlap with gender. And I'll spend a lot of time thinking about why the social organization of gender results in inequalities or differences between groups that have material effects. And some of those inequalities are inequalities in life expectancy. So in most societies, men die at younger ages than women do. And we'll think about why that happens and how we might explain it and how it's a source of inequality. And we'll look at other inequalities, material inequalities like income inequality, and ask why is it that in most societies, almost all societies, women make less than men. Across all of this, I'll be thinking about social constructionism or the idea that we return to again and again, of how it is that relationships aren't just a manifestation of the truth of our internal humanity, but instead also the product of our human actions. Or as we say again and again in this class or in these series of lectures, how we are produced by the social context that we live in and how our individual actions reproduce and in times transform those social contexts. Now, when looking at such social constructionism, our friend, that is a way in which we can really examine such constructions, is comparison. So one of the ways in which we think about how gender is socially constructed is to compare gender across different historical time periods or different kinds of societies. And one of the ways in which we see 
the construction and organization of gender is by observing how it works differently in different places. This could mean differently in rural versus urban spaces, or it could mean differences across cultures. So that if I'm from India, the sets of gender relations that I experience are quite different than if I'm from the Ivory Coast, which are quite different still than if I'm from Venezuela. And those different set of gender relations suggest the ways in which gender might be socially organized or how it is that our social institutions and our social structures work with and work on gender to produce particular kinds of societies. In this first lecture, I'm going to ask what is sex and what is gender? Increasingly, these two are blurred. The distinction is not something we always make a one between, but I'm going to make a distinction between them. Ask what does it mean for gender to be a social construction? So to elaborate on the idea of gender as a social construction and to ask how do diverse bodies and identities and experiences complicate social construction of both gender and sex. So first, let's think about the distinction between nature and nurture, um, which is in some ways hackneyed or hackneyed just means like um, we kind of like rely a little bit too on uh, much on it and it's tired from my perspective, but nonetheless, it's, it's important. And um, think about the interactions between sex, gender, nature, and nurture. Sex will define as the different biological and physiological characteristics of males and females, such as reproductive organs, chromosomes, and hormones. It's important even essential for us to recognize that there are some biological differences between groups. And those biological differences, particularly when it comes to sex, tend to be clustered in two categories. I say tend because there are actually a non-trivial number of people who do not fit into either sex category of male or female, and instead there is a deep diversity of sexual identities. Um, the work here that I would draw upon is from the feminist scholar and biologist. She's a, her actual degree is in biology of Anne Fausto Sterling, who notes that many people experience what we refer to occasionally as intersex experiences or some sexual identity in between male and female. This could mean having um, a variant on your chromosomal structure, it, or it could mean having ambiguous sexual organs. There are a wide range of ways in which many of us do not fit into the classic categories of male or female. But for the vast majority of us, there are differences in the biological and physiological characteristics of those that we identify as male and female. And in particular, we might identify reproductive organs, chromosomes, and hormones as ways in which we could help categorize those differences. Gender, by contrast, is the socially constructed characteristics of women and men, such as the norms, roles, and relationships between groups of men and women. And in general, when we talk about the social construction of gender, we're going to think about how it is that biological sex gets transformed into social gender or how it is that we interpret certain sets of differences that are biological and physiological and transform them into a series of gender relations. Now that transformation doesn't happen willy-nilly or randomly. It happens within the constraints of biological difference. But nonetheless, there is a deep way in which we all work to make sense of biological differences in terms of sociological or social categories of gender, and that we organize society around that. So in parts of society, you may be seen as either male or female, just as a birth certificate indicates the end of, that's sort of the end of the story. But the certificate only tells us about the biological determinants. It doesn't say anything about how society shapes this difference or how society seeks to manifest this difference. And if you look across different societies, you'll see different manifestations of, 
of how it is that sex gets organized into gender. And this is the phrase that I will use again and again, how it is that we organize sex into gender. One of the principles of organization is to construct categorical binaries. So one principle of organization is to say that there are males and females. And I would note that in some societies, there are actually third genders. So for example, in Pakistan and India, there's a category of people, the Kajisera, which are sometimes referred to as third gender or people who don't quite fit within this. So the push to dichotomize biological differences into two categories is one way in which we organize sex into gender, in part by denying other forms. There are other ways in which we do this. So there are other ways in which we tie a set of biological differences into a set of social institutions. That is, we formalize the difference. And if you think about the different experiences that you've had in different institutions, we can see elements of that formalization. So let me give you one light example. Um, in the high school that I went to, um, it was a private school, and um, it, was a, it had many different buildings. And the math department was in its own building. And um, so there was where the math mathematicians were. And um, for years after the school was co-educational, after it had both boys and girls at the school, um, uh, the math department had no bathroom for women. So the only bathroom in the math department was for men. Now, this you could think of as a benign thing. It's like, you know, well, people have to walk uh, uh, not very far just to the next building, which is only, you know, a 30 second walk away in order to, to use the bathroom, that is the women. But in some ways it is a deep, it has a deep social meaning because what it does is a few things. One, it suggests that men and women have to go to bathrooms in different places. It's sort of an assumption that we make that they have to do this, that this is a necessary thing, that we divide people into the categories of men and women and that they have to use bathrooms differently. One solution to this would be to say the bathrooms are unis unisex and anyone can use them. But that is not the solution that, we, that they came up with. Instead, it was to have the women walk somewhere else. This walking also produced a symbolic outcome, which was to convey to women that they didn't really belong in the math building or that the math building wasn't really made for them. Now, this is a small, but I think not trivial example of how it is that a range of decisions about how we organize space and our social communities transform differences in sex into gendered experiences, in which case we think about gender not just as something that we have or are, but it's something that we do. And that's going to be critically important for our understanding. So when we think about the social construction of gender, we think about how meanings are created in social interaction, in social interaction with one another and with social institutions in the world in which we live. The ways in which we as scholars talk about this is to say that gender isn't something that we are, it's something that we do. This idea of gender as, a, as doing has two intellectual sources. The first is a classic paper by West and Zimmerman called Doing Gender, Doing Difference. And in it, they argue that instead of thinking about gender as a series of roles that we inhabit, we should think about it as a series of actions that we undertake. And similarly, the second intellectual basis of this idea comes from Judith Butler, a very famous feminist scholar. She's not a sociologist. She's, uh, she teaches in a rhetoric department, actually. Um, but she talks about gender as a performance or the idea of performativity. Gender is something that we perform or do 
but under the conditions of structure, of societal structure. In this sense, doing gender, and this will be a phrase that you hear me say again and again, not just in terms of gender, but lots of things. Gender as a performance, gender as not as something we are, but something we do, thinks about gender as a performance where we're accountable for that performance. Other people in interactions evaluate our gendered performance and give us some degree of feedback about it. In this sense, sociologists think of gender not simply as an innate biological determined property. Instead, we think about it as a socially and culturally influenced phenomenon that is subject to change over time. Judith Butler said that gender is not a fact. Gender is something that is produced. In other words, it's an unspoken agreement to perform gender in socially acceptable ways. And the fact that our performances are so believable makes gender appear natural. It sort of naturalizes the behavior as a kind of effortless or almost foregone conclusion that makes it feel very inherent. So there's sort of classic examples that we use of this. Um, in the United States, there's deeply gendered associations for infants in terms of what they wear. And you'll often see people dressing babies who are girls in pink and boys in blue. Um, some people deeply resist this, but it's something we see fairly consistently. And it's an interesting thing because, you know, one of the reasons we do that is that babies are very difficult to gender. That is, if they're not naked in front of you, it's fairly difficult to figure out what the gender of a baby is. And you may have made mistakes before where you've said to someone of a small infant, like, oh, your daughter is so cute. And they say to you, that is my son. Um, and, and it's very important to some people that we not misgender their children. And so they construct all of these signals in order to, to tell all of us what the gender of the child is. This also includes things like toys that we buy them. So here on the screen, what do we see? We see a doll. And dolls are things that typically we buy for girls. But what this does is it suggests that we help produce a particular kind of social identity within girls and boys that's tied to our social understanding of what is acceptable within that identity. This structures the experience of different children, and those children then reflect that structural experience and produce it in their own actions. Sometimes when boys choose to wear dresses, little boys, they will be scolded by other people. They will be disciplined for doing so. Or when girls play with trucks, they may not get the same positive feedback for doing so if they were playing with a house or with a doll. We guide children to discover and understand what acceptable gendered performances are and eventually, those sets of constraints that we place upon children turn into their preferences. Or, in other words, the structures that we place upon children through the kinds of things that we expect from them deeply impact those children and begin to be reflected in those children's actions so that the children's performance is incredibly believable. It is, in fact, in some ways natural. It is what the children want to do, but they want to do it in part because we've structured their experience in ways that make it clear what is desirable for them as a gendered person in the world. That is, we convey to them, this is what you should be doing, and then they, in many ways, start to want to do that kind of thing. But as we think about that social construction of gender and that performance of gender that happens, we might ask ourselves why it is or how it is that we can push beyond a simple binary understanding of gender relations. A gender binary, gender divided into two categories, is just one type of gender system. But I'd ask you to think for a moment Reflect for a moment on your own life 
and on the people around you. And ask yourself, are there examples of non-binary expressions? Even within the strict binary system of the United States, where I live, there's always been room for change, growth, and flexibility. Gender terms change through time and represent different ways of doing gender. There are girly girls versus tomboys. So we might think of girlness as a kind of continuum where some girls really love pink and princess dresses and things that we think of as extreme expressions of girlness, whereas some girls are, in, in a, a one phrase, tomboys. That is, um, girls who really like playing in the dirt and using trucks and doing things that are typically socially organized as boy-like activities. Among men, we have a range of different gendered expressions where you could think of men who are emo um, or this kind of like have this um, uh, emotional quality to them, listen to a particular kind of music. They may even wear eyeliner or other kinds of things like this, um, perhaps nail polish on their fingernails. That is a gendered expression that moves beyond a simple binary expression of gender. Or there is the example, it's a little old now, but an example of the metrosexual, um, usually a heterosexual man who may have more um, effeminate demeanor that seems somehow to be slightly more feminine. We might ask ourselves, what are female masculinities or ways in which women who are identified as women um, express themselves in ways that we think of as being more masculine? Or what are, the, what are male femininities, ways in which men may inhabit, enact, or perform different kinds of feminine expressions? I give you the example here of David Bowie, who stands before you singing. And you can see that David Bowie is not just wearing eyeliner, but a series of makeup at his eyes um, and um, a, a dress and a performance of self that is pushing the boundaries of masculinity, that is in some ways challenging an idea of masculinity, of what it means to be man, and in some ways what it means to exist within a binary construction of difference, and to say maybe we can push the bounds of this binary. So you may hear at some point in time, or you may have heard, or you may yourself have said that we should think beyond the binary. And what this, in effect, means is that we should think beyond the transformation of biological sex into two binary conditions of gender, male and female, and ask how it is that different performances seek to blur the boundaries of that distinction, seek to challenge some of that distinction, and seek to transform our understanding of gender. Reflect back again on what a social construction is. What does this mean? It means that there are social conditions that are producing particular forms of agency and self-understanding that are transforming those social conditions. So we exist in a moment right now where people are challenging binary gender systems and seeking to transform them into something else, something different, something that is another form of expression. I want to take one step back here and note something really important. It's not just about gender, but actually is about almost all categories. It's a near truism that there's almost all, always more variation within categories than between categories. I'll repeat that. It's a near truism that there is almost always more variation within categories than between categories. What does that mean? If we have two categories of a thing, the differences between people within any one of those categories is probably much bigger than the differences between the average people in those two categories. So let's take an example of this, and we'll take an example of gender. On average, women are more different from one another than they are from men. Or on average, 
men are more different from one another than they are on average from women. So, for example, men make more money on average than women do in almost all societies. But the difference between the poorest man and the richest man is way bigger than the difference between men on average and women on average, right? So the difference in wages between men and women may be, you know, let's say 80 cents on the dollar, so um, 20%, uh, something like that, um, or, uh, but um, the difference between um, men or within the male category is huge. Some men make zero dollars a year and some may make a billion dollars a year from owning a huge amount of stock or something like that. That's a much bigger difference than 80%. When we look at categories, this will almost always be the case. There's greater difference between people within China than there is between people in China and the United States on average. The poorest person in China versus the richest person in China are far more different from one another than the average person in China and the average person in the United States. Across any range of categories that we look at, there will be more variation within versus between. You're going to hear me say this across several subsequent lectures. And this observation about the large degrees of difference within categories is part of how we might begin to think about the blurring of those categories, the pushing of those categories, the transformation of those categories. And before you think about this as a deeply modern phenomenon, I want to end with a picture here and a picture of uh, two different people. Um, on uh, one hand is Henry VIII. Um, this is a copy of a famous painting by Hans Holbein of Henry VIII, who was um, the King of England uh, in the late 1500s. Um, uh, in, in, and, um, or in the 1500s. And Henry stands before you as the paragon of masculinity, the absolute representative of masculinity within English society at this moment in time. He faces forward aggressively. He has a knife upon him. He has a cod piece in between his legs that represents his virility. And yet, if we were to look at this kind of today, we would be like, wow, that's a very, very strange expression of masculinity. He is wearing silken, puffy robes. He has tights on, leggings in effect. He's wearing what might be like a little one-piece dress of some kind. Um, none of this makes sense within our own understanding of masculinity. Next to Henry is someone who I picked because I was like, it's actually an interesting picture to compare to Henry VIII. This is Sasha Velour, who was a, a contestant on an American show called RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, which is a show where people dress up in drag, um, uh, which is to say a particular kind of dress that wouldn't be associated with their um, own gender identity and um, perform within it. And I would say that if we juxtapose Sasha Velour and Henry VIII here, one of the things that we see is the different ways in which performances of gender vary over time and are things that we play in or work with. This is what it means to talk about gendered expressions as something that we do, something that we perform. Both Sasha Velour and Henry VIII are performing gender within the logic of the historical and sociocultural moment that they're from. Henry's expression of gender in his time period is a deep expression of masculinity. And Sasha Velour's expression is clearly an instance of drag. But it's an interesting instance of drag because Velour chooses not to wear a wig, for example, and show their baldness. Um, this is something that many of us do in different ways. We each try to express our own identities through a set of social structural conditions that we think of as gender. And in doing that, we both reaffirm 
some of those structural conditions, but also push to transform them. If I were to stand before you today dressed as Henry VIII, in all likelihood you would interpret that as some degree of drag, not actually an expression of masculinity. And yet, were I to do that, one of the things that I would be doing is seeking to push the boundaries of a gendered binary, to push our understandings of how gender is organized through my own actions. And as such, the performances happen within scripts that we inherit, but we have an expressive capacity within that performance in order to potentially transform the scripts such that, you know, a um, little less than 500 years ago, Henry VIII could stand before you in this kind of dress and look like the paragon of masculinity, whereas today that kind of dress is closer to what Sasha Velour is, is performing in a gendered challenging of binary understandings of gender and instead seeks to transform our subjective and intersubjective experience and understanding of gender.